Welcome everyone to our weekly webinar. If we didn't introduce ourselves before, it's me, Josh, and I'm joined by uh, Kathy, our Assistant Academic Manager. And uh, we're going to be talking about using games in the English classroom. Um, let me just move on. Uh, as always, you will receive a certificate of participation in a webinar handout in the next few days. Uh, if you don't, there's a website, there's an email address to, to send an email to and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, that all of the information here, including descriptions of all the games and rules and any information and some uh, uh, visual information too, is on that. So you won't need the slides, that'll give you enough. And it also has some useful links for other things, some other websites talking about games um some videos things like this okay so let us know if you don't receive that okay we um sometimes some people get left off okay um just to begin uh, games are as i'm sure everyone knows an essential motivation tool for uh students of any age in any school subject while we all know we have a lot to cover in our courses okay you know we know that you can't spend all day playing games, but uh, I think if we focus some on certain grammar points or some vocabulary or whatever needs you have, they, they can really keep them involved. You know, we're not talking about these as games, as alternatives to learning. I think we're talking about it as something to supplement their learning. Okay? Moreover, it's, it's quite a nice way to, to test them at an end of a unit as well, mm. because, uh, you know, they're, they're dying to, to be involved in the game. So you're able to see how much, for example, vocabulary they've, they've um, remembered from that unit by playing a game. Yeah, for sure. Particularly vocabulary games are always great to do that. You can aim them at the vocabulary that you've been looking at. You know, if they've talked, if you've been talking about foods or things like this, then why not play a game that tests that instead of just asking them to describe a picture or whatever? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we you can use familiar games. So, for example, noughts and crosses, or so known as tic tac toe. We haven't included that in this one. Maybe in the next one, I can show you some ways that uh, noughts and crosses can be used in uh, to talk about vocabulary or even to talk about grammar. Okay, um, but there's also possibility to use new games. You know, again, a couple of the games you'll see here, I would imagine you probably don't know about. Okay, so. Uh, you know, there's always games you can make up as well. So, you know, that's some, I know the one that I'll be talking about later. I've, uh, I learned a basic form of it, but I've um, put in some extra things that worked for me over the years playing it with students. Um, let us know if you've played games in uh, your classes. Let us know in the chat. Are there, do you use them at certain times of the year? Do you use them with certain levels for certain grammar points? What games do you play? Please let us know. I'd be very interested to know. Um, at the end of this session, I hope you will be able, be better able to effectively use games in order to revise units of language, um, to see how drilling and repetition of form is easily hidden in a game. So these things that might seem a bit boring or repetitive to students, introducing an element of competition or of a challenge can really make it uh, much more interesting and fun. Okay? And obviously give students the opportunity to use English in a meaningful way instead of doing exercises which might not be relevant or realistic. Something, even a game, can be uh, more realistic than those exercises. I'll hand over to Cathy now because she's going to talk about uh, different types of warmers. Great, thank you. Yes, the, the first few games we're going to look at are all quite short games that can either be used um, as warmers, uh, as fillers, or at the end of the lesson. Um, so okay. please do get involved and tell us what is the purpose of a warmer and how long should okay. it last? Okay. Let us know. Someone raised their hand. Uh... Abundanza raised her hand. So let us know in the chat if you want to uh, ask us a question or anything. Okay. So warmers are generally there at the beginning of the lesson uh, in order to grab the student's attention. 
first and foremost uh, to elicit or revise vocabulary from from previous le previous lessons so you can also kind of pre-test the students and see how much of the vocabulary uh, they already know from the from the lesson that you're about to give them as well mm. by by having a vocabulary sure. game at the beginning yeah sometimes you can get the essential vocabulary there so that they proceed with the lesson um or to to revise a grammar point and again this is a really nice way of recycling things from previous lessons have a quick kind of revision of, of, a, of a previous grammar point, but make it into a game, make it something quick so you can come back to those again and again, because often you do need to come back to those to those grammar points before the students are really able to use it. Mm. Uh, so the first uh, the first game that we have here is a spelling a spelling game. One thing I didn't say before about all these warmers are they're really, really easy to set up mm. um, and they don't take much preparation at all. So if you're coming into the classroom and you know you have to do something for five, 10 minutes, this is a really nice game to put up on the board because it doesn't take much um, input from the teacher. Um, in fact, this is just sorry to interrupt, but that's a really good point uh, I wanted to make is that uh, what we've tried to focus on this lesson is things we don't have any handouts or sorry worksheets in the handout this week because we're not talking about games that you need to prepare a board game or cards or things like that okay these are things that as long as you know the rules and we've written the rules and the ideas in the handout and in the slides here you should be able to just walk into the class and as long as you have a uh, whiteboard or a blackboard okay, um, you should be able to go ahead with it Sometimes a stopwatch might help. Yeah, we, we always talk about the benefit for the student, but of course, there's a lot of benefit for the teacher mm. um, with, with these games that we're going to look at and that it takes the pressure off the teacher a little bit. Um, but why don't we go ahead and, and play this game? Mm. And so we have a word on the, on the blackboard here. The word is milkshake. And we're seeing how many words we can find within this longer word. There's an example there, which is same. Does it count if I say milk and shake? Hmm. Why not? Why, Why not? not? Yeah. Two, straight off the bat. There you go. Okay, what a genius I am. Okay. What other words can you find in this, in this long word? So let us know in the chat, really come and get involved. I'd like to, this webinar particularly to um, include a bit of interaction. So uh, right in the chat. Oh, Tanya's got a good run. Oh, here they're coming in now. You've got okay. a shame, make, like. Great. Okay. Yeah. So here's, here we have some. Great. Lake. Lake. Okay. She. This is a little bit like that uh, British TV show Countdown where they have to form words and the, I think it's the longest one wins, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Silk, that's a nice one. We also have sake, mother. Mother, I don't think, I don't see an O in there. So I'm afraid. Um, true, Christine, true. I'm not I haven't sure. even checked okay. on that. Okay. You could buy a vowel if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Great one there. Obviously, Benefits to put a word with a lot of different letters and long enough. Okay, so you're looking at having a eight to nine letter word. Okay. Yeah, the longer the better, of course, but it has to be a word that they already know. Mm. Uh, that's also really important with this game. Oh, ilk. Wow, I like that one, Anna. Mm. Okay, of his elk. Yeah. So students love this because it's a competition. Um, of course, and they're also kind of battling against themselves. Um, I always find it really effective game, this one. Yep. I mean, you could play this in a couple of ways. You could have uh, give them five minutes to find as many words as possible. You could either, otherwise you could have a prize. You know, the winner could be someone, the person who has the longest word, which is always good. Okay. Um, if, most, if they're tired as well. Mm, slightly risky, but if if the kids are really tired and you and you want to give them a bit of energy, you could um, get them to run up and write the actually write the word on the on the blackboard. 
Wow, I like these coming in. Slim. See that? Ash. Ash. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. okay. Lash. I just saw. Okay. On the lash. Okay. Meal. Okay, look, we'll move on a bit, but keep them coming in. Milkshake is the word. So keep them coming in and we'll move on to the second activity. Uh, this is another good game. Um, Josh, I might actually get you to you to play this one uh, with me, so we can so we can show them how it goes. Uh, there isn't much of a language focus to this game. Um, this one really is just about grabbing their attention, and so if you can tell that they're not really paying attention, play this game with them really quickly for five minutes, and you will definitely have their attention once again. Um, so what do we do? We stand the students uh, in a circle and get them to quickly count to 10. So the first student sends one, the second student says two, and so on and so on. Can we then do you, that? We won't have to do that part. <laughs> no, okay, thank God. Yeah. Uh, then you introduce the times tables. I personally always use the three times table uh, and the five times table. And you explain to the students in the next round on multiples of three, you must clap instead of saying the number. And so like this, it's really important that they're all listening to each other so they know when they have to clap, they know what number they're up to in the circle. Once they've successfully done that, it might take one or two or three rounds um, for them to do that. And I find they become, they give more and more attention each time because here there's no single winner. They only win if they all work together and they're all listening, which is quite nice because the, the objective is to get to 30. Uh, so once you've successfully done it with the three times table, then you introduce the five times table. And, and this say, is in the same thing, isn't it? So This is in the same thing, yeah. There, yeah. Um, so every time a multiple of five comes up, they have to stomp instead of saying the multiple of five. So it gets it gets confusing when it's a multiple of five and three. So what are they, stomp and clap? They stomp and clap, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Should we give a little <laughs> demo? Okay, let's try, okay. Okay, one. Two. Oh, sorry, now, four. Are we doing five as well now? Oh, I was just gonna do I was just okay. gonna do both at the same time. Um hang on. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Uh eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Okay. Uh Six, oh, sorry, 16. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> oh, no, now we have to go back to one. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, I hope you I hope you get the idea. Uh, you can do sometimes say. funny words too. You can put in, I've done like bing bong or something like that, you know, as uh, who was it? Someone in the chat said uh, boom. Okay? So Benedetta said boom. You can put in boom, bing bong, things like that. Okay? That's a really good idea. I've never tried that. Yeah. And so it gets people laughing. I think uh, one of the key things here is obviously, you know, we can help their maths as well. But I mean, the key there is to get them to pay attention, you know, that they're listening to other people, that they're thinking that, you know, I find, you know, when you're getting students to go in a group doing numbers, if they're doing odd numbers or even numbers, often it catches out the people who aren't paying attention, right? You know, they can really focus them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, the next game that we have here um, engages also their memory. And so I call this game uh, the shopping list. Um, we're starting now to, to look at games that focus on um, vocabulary instead of just grabbing their attention like the, like the last two games we've looked at. So we write on the board, I went to the supermarket and I bought an apple. You can underline the A or something in the apple, couldn't you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then we nominate a student to, to add an item and they have to repeat the whole sentence. So it would go, I went to the supermarket and I bought an apple 
and two bananas. The third student then repeats the whole phrase again and of course adds an item that begins with C. So the example that we've given here, of course, is with items that you would find in a supermarket, but there's no reason why you couldn't play this game uh, focusing on a different topic. So, for example, um, you could say I went to the shopping mall and I bought, for example, or I went to the pet shop and I found or again, I bought or I took home. Uh, and this clothes, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Parts of the city, I went to Paris and I saw uh, something like this, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with weaker classes, I always do put the alphabet up on the board um, just so that they have that there when they're trying to recall the item uh, yeah. because we're not actually testing their memory. Of course, we can help them out uh, a little bit. Whereas with stronger classes, you might want to add an extra element. So ask them, um, say that they require also a quantifier. So we could say a bunch of bananas, several apples. Mm. Yeah, it's good, probably good, quite good for countable and uncountable things too. So that they say an apple, but uh, you know, I bought some flour or something like this. Yeah, yeah, many, many muffins, much rice, mm. yeah. So countable and uncountable, this could be, you know, a revision of countable and uncountable, which generally are you know, uh, very common in foods and, you know, generally tricks a lot of Italian students when you have things like uh, spaghetti being singular uncountable or mm -hmm. uh, broccoli or spinach being singular in English right? and then uh, things like grapes being plural. So these are sort of things that I find confuse people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you could as well, if you have some extra time at the end of the lesson, kids really, really enjoy this, is if you come back to the game at the end and see if any of the students can still remember that list. And uh, it always surprises me that this, that that there are some students that can remember um, the whole list, which yeah. I always find impossible after a full lesson. Yeah, good though. Using all of the students together, they might be able to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, playing this game at the beginning of the, of the lesson isn't ideal, of course, with a huge group because there's only ever one student um, that's speaking at a time. So with a, with a class of more than 10 or 15 i would i would break them up into smaller groups to play this game mm, yeah next that we have scategories uh, this is a game that it's I actually a board playing. game isn't it you yeah it. yeah 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 does anybody um is anyone familiar with this game let us know in the chat if you've played it before it's a bit like uh for example, a game like Taboo that we talked about uh, recently in a webinar. Uh, taboo is something that you can buy a board game, but to be honest, it's quite easy to make it yourself in a class activity. So this is the sort of thing that uh, we're not necessarily saying you need to go out and buy this uh, this thing, but uh, you know you can use this, the concept in your classes. Let us know if you've played it or you know what it is. Yeah. And the, the, often the objective with this game for the students is to think of the least common word within a topic. So it's really nice to get them to uh, think about all that vocabulary that they know and stop using the same words again and again and again. Um, so how do we play? Um, write one to four categories on the board and group the students into small groups of four or five students. Then on a piece of paper, they jot down four words for each category. And this is where they have to be thinking of that, that vocabulary that's less common because they're only going to score points if they write a word that another group hasn't written. Do you want to give them an example of a category? 
happy yeah. for teachers. You know. Yeah, let's play. Um, okay. The category is types of shoes. Okay, so write down, don't write down these, write down them separately, but write four types of shoes or footwear, okay? But you'll need to write them with a comma we need, separate. We need all four, yeah. Okay, and then the ones that cross over, okay? Oh, they're not crossing over yet, okay? Wow. I think they know that our participants know more shoes than me. Okay? <laughs> I wear the same shoes every day. That's <laughs> fine. Okay. Shoes wedge. Wow. Okay. So in this case, so if someone, if two people said slippers, then they wouldn't get a point. Neither, neither would get any points. Yeah, exactly. Right. But we've got some great ones in here, like wedges, Wellingtons. Obviously, ideally, you would play this where they do it secretly and then you combine it. You do it, don't you? So obviously yeah. doing it in the chat doesn't work so well because we're, uh, you know, seeing each other's choices. Okay? I don't mean yeah. you could even do it like this. I imagine you could go round and every new person has to think of one that hasn't been said before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, the nice thing about this game is they're working together as well. So they're also repeating that vocabulary to each other within the group. And so that's all that repetition of, of the words, which is really good as well. Oh, sorry, I preempted your let's play. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, and then when they when they're reading out their list, once they've created the list together, and then they're reading it out to the rest of the group, all the other students are, are then hearing those words again. So it's just this repetition of the vocabulary, or the vocabulary all the time, which is really, really good. It's great too because you can sort of make use of the more uh, advanced students in your class to, to, you know, share the role of teacher. You can get them even to explain what this is, okay? There's someone yeah. need to explain what yeah, wedges yeah, exactly. are to me, for example. Hmm? Not really sure. What are wedges? Are they high-heeled shoes that don't? Wedges, yeah, they're like a platform. Okay. Uh, they're, all, they're all back in fashion again. And the shoes are sort of another <laughs> world to me, honestly. Um, so, yeah, that's an important point that, that you made there, Josh, that this is an opportunity for the, for the, the students to really teach each other because that's what they're doing. They're learning from each other as mm. they brainstorm this vocabulary. Um, okay, so how can we adapt this game for different language focuses? So we looked at um, uh, footwear here or clothing. You could do it for animals. So the four different categories could be animals that can swim but live on land. Uh, the second could be anim animals that fly, uh, animals that have a tail. Um, we could go for different sports. So sports you play with the ball. Um, team sports. sports. Team yeah. sports, yeah, of course. Um, or another topic could be foods. Oh yeah, foods you can eat, food you can eat with your hands, or healthy foods, or Oops. fruit or vegetables. Of course, these are the different. Mm. Great way to introduce a topic. You know, you can get a lot of those vocabulary there before you actually start talking. You know, if you're going to do some reading about, I don't know, it might be. Uh, a civics lesson on uh, England okay, or the monarchy, you can talk about all the, the words, you know, prince, princess, king, queen, things like that. Okay. Yeah, I think Benedetta said it right that we have this, uh, you know, that they say, normia cosa città, okay, um, in Italian, the one that I was describing before, but uh, in this case, they actually sort of focus on one of these things. Okay. Yeah. I always like playing these sort of things where if someone, they've got to do it silently, and if you hear one out loud, you write it on the board and that disqualifies that word from being used. Mm. Okay? So it sort of often gets students to uh, work quietly, which is... Uh, yeah, that's great classroom management. I've never thought about that before. Not always the easiest thing to do in the uh, Italian class, as I'm sure a lot of our participants yeah, but, uh, you know, there's a time for, to let them speak. But, uh, 
So if you, you play this, uh, the categories, then you can always say, if I hear when any of these words are going up on the board, they're not valid. Okay. Um, next one, whisper dictation. Yeah, so now we're going to look at a couple of games that you can use to revise a grammar point. So either if you want to do that immediately after it's been taught to them, or whether you're coming back to it after a couple of weeks to see if they can still remember the, the correct form really is, is what we're going for with this game. Um, another good one to, to keep them quiet, uh, because of course it's in the name, it is a whisper dictation. Um, so we stand the, the students in two rows or even more, depending on how many students you have, maybe in, in lines of five, all facing the, the whiteboard or the blackboard. The teacher then whispers a short phrase to the, the first student in, in each row. Uh, if you're playing with more than two rows, I find you can, you can write the phrase onto a piece of paper and then just show it to those students. Mm. So then they go back to the, to the beginning of their, of their rows. Having to the read, first student, right, yeah. To, just to the first student in each line, yeah. Um, you then say go, and they have to turn around and whisper the, the phrase to the, to the second student, who then turns around and, of course, whispers it to the, to the third student. Mm. Uh, but, of course, in whispering it, uh, it changes. They have to repeat it many times. Um, and so they pass it down the line, and the last student runs to the, to the front of the line towards the whiteboard or blackboard. And you can either ask them to shout out the sentence or to write it onto the board. Okay. Uh, how do we make this about a grammar point? And so if you're teaching them about using the gerund after these state words like love, eating, hate, eating, uh, this is the sentence that you're, you're asking them to, to repeat. I don't know if any Italian student would repeat that sentence. Yeah. That's why it's such a fantastic <laughs> one to use because they're outraged, yeah. absolutely outraged by it. So it's really it's a good one to use. You know, it's what makes it fun. Uh, the 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 sillier the sentences are, the the more fun it is. Sure. Of course. Um, if you're looking at frequency adverbs, you could do one like this. On Fridays, penguins never eat fish and chips. Um, or if you're if you're looking at the present perfect, you could say, "Sorry, Mrs. M, I haven't done my homework yet." Mm. Sometimes, yeah, you can see how these change. If you, they're doing the present simple, you can put in a third person, mm. you know, and that might that might disappear, you know, through there, mm -hmm. and you can point that out as a bit of error correction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this game is another way to uh, revise a grammar point. Um, and it's a really, really nice way for getting them to listen to each other as well. Uh, because again, um, uh, they do want to win, but they can only win if they work together as a class. They're not actually competing against each other uh, in this game. Uh, the game's called 20 questions and the grand point that, that you would be um, focusing on is, is question forms. Yeah, a good thing to focus on for um, students, I find. Particularly yeah. for students who aren't used to changing particularly between affirmative and question forms. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's really like putting that auxiliary verb um, at, at the beginning, which, as you said, is particularly difficult sometimes. Um, the nice, the other thing, like I said about this game, is that it's just that repetition. They hear, they hear the form again and again and again as they form the questions, but as their peers are, are asking questions as well. And sometimes I, when I play these sort of things, often uh, if a student doesn't do the correct question form, they don't get an answer. Okay? They forfeit their go. I'm the bad cop. I'm, so, oh, I'm starting to realise that. You can be quite <laughs> harsh in your classroom. It's not, not, it's not all fun. You know. <laughs> Game for me, not necessarily for them. <laughs> uh, 
so we tell the students or the teacher tells the students um, that they're thinking of an animal or um, a classroom object um, or a food, for example, and the students have to guess what it is. But of course, they only have 20 questions as a class together. Um, and the teacher can only answer yes or no to each of these questions. Um, really to check that they're all listening and they're, and they're all taking, taking part in the activity, or if you think that some of the students need to have a summary of, of the information that has passed, you could ask some of the students to, to summarize um, all the information that has been found out already by question pen. So for example, if we're doing an animal and they say, uh, can it swim? Um, uh, is it big? Then by, by question 10, the information that, you, that you're trying to get back from them is the animal can swim and it is big. Yeah, and it often like speeds them on a bit because when they put all that information together, then it'll be much clearer. Mm -hmm. what, what the animal is. Eh? Mm -hmm. With that game, I often, uh, sorry to do it back, um, when I play it often, uh, they sometimes I have it that uh, they can't ask me what the game, what the actual thing is. They can't say, is it a phone? Until they ask me a question that can only be true for that object. So is it something that you call people with? If, they, if I say yes to that, then I give them another one and they can ask for that thing. But, you know, otherwise you will get people wasting a lot of questions saying, is it a desk? Is it a phone? Is it a um, chair? Is it, they'll just be looking at true, the true. That's a good room. Point. Okay? So I sometimes forbid them until maybe even, uh, you know, the later questions they, that uh, they have to get to question 15 before they can actually ask you what it is. So it just keeps them asking more questions because that sort of question, is it a, is not a hard question to make, but a question like, does it fly or, you know, things like this. So can you call people on it? It's going to be much more difficult. Mm -mm. Um, you could also remember that you could also switch this round and have the teacher sitting out for a round and one student has to answer, has to think of the object and answer the questions. Yeah, or you can you can put them into groups, and then the teacher can go around and, and monitor um, how well the students are actually forming the questions. So so that teacher has an idea what question forms they need to, to go back and, and study with the students again. Okay, um, I'll take over, and I'm just going to look at two games. Uh, this one is just a minute. You may know this. Uh, it's actually a radio show on the BBC. It's actually been going since 1967 and it's almost 1,000 episodes now. It's got a tried and tested format. Now, the format we play is not exactly the one there, but uh, as it says on the website, contestants are challenged to speak for one minute without hesitation, deviation, or repetition on any subject that comes up on the cards. Now, in the game, they often get on the, on the um, radio show it's often a bit of a comedy thing where they have to talk about a very obscure subject but you can give them subjects that are relevant to what you've been studying in class whether it's a civics lesson whether it's uh um you know even you've been talking about a particularly part of grammar okay sorry not grammar but maybe a bit more vocabulary okay um it can be played in your classroom to practice your students speaking skills there's a few rules that are essential. These are rules, again, that I, you know, some of them I've tended to develop. Some of them are in all these games. But uh, you can put these on the board. And what you can do is if you number these, or even I've given them sort of quite short uh, names, the other students can uh, be encouraged to challenge. If a student is speaking and violates one of the rules, the students yell out or, you know, whatever, or interrupt, okay? when the rule is violated. The rules I generally play with are obviously no long pauses. Doesn't mean, I think you sometimes have to encourage the students not, they don't necessarily have to talk quickly, okay? They need to talk steadily, okay? Um, no digression, they can't get off the topic. If you tell them to talk about, um, I don't know, Italian food, 
Okay, I don't think they'll have any problems talking about that for um, uh, one minute. But they can't move on to things about, you know, my mum makes really good pasta and, uh, you know, we usually eat it on Thursdays and after that we watch a film. And it's like, you're digressing now, okay? No repetition. Now, it doesn't mean they can't repeat the same words, but I find that if they're struggling, they might come back and say, you know, I like pasta a lot. We eat it a lot during the week. And then later on, They'll say, you know, oh, I eat it every week or every day, things like this. And you can say no repetition because they're just recycling what they've said before. No lists. Again, it's quite easy. If you start to say Italian food, they might just start listing, listing things. I think three is acceptable, but beyond that. So, you know, spaghetti, pasta, spaghetti, pizza, and then if they want to start talking about mozzarella, polenta, things like this, you know, they have to start talking about something else before, okay? Some other rules I put in was no I, I, I. What this generally means is that they can't keep on talking about themselves, okay? It forces them to use some other language and they, you know, instead of saying I like pasta, I eat it every day, and uh, I also like pizza, you know, I have that once a week. Too many sentences with I, they're not really pushing themselves. It might be best to, to move on to what other people like, food in general, what's the food produced in your area, what's, uh, um, what food people buy at the shops, things like this. There's so many things to talk about in each topic as long as you keep them general, okay? And then I have the rule, no rubbish. And again, you can get people to shout out things like, no, you know, instead of shouting out no digression, they just say digression, okay? Or rubbish, and rubbish in the way of saying what you're saying is not true, okay? You know, if someone says, you know, uh, I don't know, I, I play football all the time, you know, I always play football. That's not true. You're not really using the sense of always. Okay? So if they challenge that, because people will start to exaggerate and start to say things that just frankly aren't true. Okay? So they can police that. I think it's a, a fun game to play, and uh, you can even get other students to make topics. Okay? Um, it's really challenging as well, and students love to be challenged. Hmm. Okay. I, can, I can imagine that uh, the first time around it's quite difficult for them, but they would love to come back to this game. For speaking for, um, you could even practice it with things, for example, uh, when you're practicing for the B1 or B2 Cambridge exams, the second part of that, I think it's the second part where they're looking at the picture. So um, that's a one minute uninterrupted speaking. So you can even start with this sort of thing once they get confident with these without putting in the pauses or the repetition then you can give them a picture and they should be a lot better at doing that. Okay? What I used to play is play if in the classrooms I used to teach in, sometimes we had a clock on the wall with the hands. If you can take it off the wall, what you can do is turn it so that the minute hand, the, the second hand is up. And then once it goes round, okay, you're finishing. The great thing about that is you can keep turning it every time they make a pause you turn it a bit so the the the, um, the second hand stays. So every second that they're pausing or they did a repetition, you take that time off. So the one minute turns into two or three. Okay, the That's more great. Pause, okay? Works if you've got one of those. If not, you can always on your phone just press pause. Okay? Um, I think it's a really good fun game to play. The last thing, although this will take a little while to explain, is uh, a game that one of my favourite things to play whenever I have to come into a class, particularly in summer in our MLA summer schools. Um, sometimes I'm asked to cover us a, uh, a lesson, and uh, if I don't have anything prepared, I often do this. Okay? Um, I call it grammar casino. Some other people call it grammar auction, but uh, I think it's a great way to play. Um, it's ideally used at the end of a class or at the end of the week, the end of a semester or a unit, okay? Um, and it's a fun way of doing error correction. So testing the, the grammar that you've been looked at. 
you've been looking at. You can use it with vocabulary or even for spelling and things like this, but I think it's better as grammar. And if you've been looking at present perfect or the conditionals, it's great to put these in. Okay. Um, in my experience, students will love playing this and just be warned that, that you play it once, they might want to play it again and again and again. Okay. Um, the concept of the game is that you divide the students in two teams. Okay. So half the class. Okay? They have to bet on whether an English sentence, the sentence that you write up on the board, is correct or incorrect grammatically. Possibly you could include spelling as well. Okay? Um, if the sentence is incorrect, they can only win their bet if they correct the error. So not only do they have to identify if it's correct or incorrect, but if it's incorrect, they have to identify the error and correct the error. Okay, we'll go through and I'll give you a bit more details. Remember, all of these details are on the handout. Okay, um, I'll give you a little explanation. There's some ground rules. Okay, so what we have is you divide the group, the group, the class into group two groups. Okay, they can choose their own names. Okay, we'll give them names if you want. Okay, each group has to nominate one student as a scribe, that is the person who's going to write, and this student you give a piece of paper and a pen. Okay. That's a, it's best you get a loose leaf of paper that is not in their book, or at least they tear out a page, because these you'll need to collect at certain times in the game. Okay. Write the team names on the board. Here we have uh, the wolves and the foxes. Okay. Um, we have uh, you explain that each team has 200 pounds in the bank. You can make it 100, you can make it less, but uh, I think 200 is a nice amount. They can bet in multiples of 10. So we're not taking bets of 57 or 62 pounds, not unless you're better at maths than I am. Okay? Um, and uh, then you have a minimum bet. Okay? I usually start with a minimum bet of 40. Okay? So that means that they can bet from 40, 50, 60, et cetera, up to the maximum of 200. Okay? So that's what you're going to write on the board. With the, the group name, the, the team names and minimum bet and the arrows, those are going to remain. So you could even do those in one color and then the amounts, then the, the amount of money in another color so that you can erase those if you want. Okay? The teacher writes a sentence on the board. Each group must decide if the sentence is correct or incorrect. They must discuss this as a group. So each group discusses again not interrupting the other group. So they're sort of whispering. Okay? And then when they're ready, they need to tell the teacher if they think the sentence is correct or incorrect. Okay? If they say the thing is correct, so we have the example here. The teacher has written, he played tennis on Tuesdays. Okay? So if they think it's correct, the teacher puts a tick next to the team name. Okay, for example, the wolves think it's correct. This doesn't mean it is correct. It's just what the students in that group think. And if they say it's incorrect, a cross goes next to the name. So the foxes have bet, have bet that this is incorrect. Okay? You, once that's on the board, they can't change. Okay? And so they also have to decide as a group. Exactly. Okay. You can't I can't kind of shout say, out immediately. Yeah, I generally say it's got to be democratic. You know, they can vote between themselves. Okay. They also must decide on how much they're going to bet. Okay. Generally, I write this. So, for example, the foxes have bet 100 pounds, and the wolves, who aren't so certain, maybe they've changed their mind whether it's uh, correct or incorrect, have said that uh, it's uh, only 40. They're only going to risk the minimum bet there. Okay, let us know in the chat. Okay, what you think? I think uh, I hope you you can see if it's correct or incorrect. Let us know. Okay. Um, now what happens next is if both groups said the sentence was correct, now the teacher reveals if the student if the sentence was correct or incorrect. So, um, what it means is that in this case we have the wolves say it's correct and the foxes say it's incorrect. In the case they both say it's correct, then basically there's no more. You just need to say it's correct or incorrect. And whether that um, 
you know, they you, they get the money they bet added on to the two hundred. If they if they were right, if they were wrong, it's taken away, so it would become one hundred sixty. Okay, I hope that's clear. Um, then you play another round. However, what will happen most often is if one group or both thinks that the sentence is wrong, the group has to discuss and decide what the correct sentence is. Okay, and so that group. In this case, it would be the foxes get together. Okay? You haven't revealed if this is correct or incorrect yet in this case, okay? because you're saying, okay, you said it's incorrect foxes. Now you need to write the correct sentence. They get together, talk about it, give them a time limit, maybe one minute, two minutes. Okay? And then they need to decide that that's what they're going to do and then hand you that paper there. The teacher writes it on the board, that is the what the student wrote, okay, on that side. So the foxes are on the right hand of the board, so they've written it there, and the teacher writes exactly what is written on the paper. Um, if the two groups have different correct sentences, the teacher will write it once on one side and once on the other side, okay? Um, and uh, if the students are correct in the same way, maybe you can write it in the middle. Okay. Uh, the teacher checks and asks them to confirm that this is what they wrote. This might be the time when you need to be very careful that some of the students will see the other group's answer and they might say, oh, we want to change ours. No, that's why you collect the paper and you say, well, this is what the paper says. Okay. Um, no further corrections are possible there. Now, the teacher puts a tick or cross next to the original sentence. So this is sometimes I even get them to give me a, a drum roll okay, where you're going to reveal whether this is correct or incorrect. Okay. So the first sentence, the first sentence was, I hope you realize was wrong. Okay. And then uh, so that's revealed, but it doesn't necessarily mean the fox's sentence is correct. Okay. Another drum roll will show actually that that sentence is wrong. Let me know in the chat, does anyone know why that sentence is still wrong? Um, the, this is one I've used many times. So before, sneaky. Okay, because students aren't, oh, Margarita's got it. Okay, yeah. Okay. Be careful if you're going to do this, make sure you do it with a T Tuesday or Thursday because lowercase M's, W's, and S's look very similar. Okay, so you know it might not be clear when they write their one. Okay, but uh, you know this is why I often get them to write it up on the. Uh, I write it up on the board so that I can say it's exactly. And you say, does this correspond to what you wrote, so that they can't come back and say I've written it incorrectly. Okay, um, if necessary, the teacher writes the correct sentence on the board. So if you know now, we have he plays tennis on. Tuesdays with a capital T. Okay? Um, the bank account amounts are adjusted and the next round begins. Okay? Uh, I think... Uh, well, I made you... a really nice um, comment in, in the chat there about that last game, uh, about how it, again, allows the, the students to teach each other because those that are, that are sure of the correct answer can explain why, which is... Mm, exactly, and that's something point. you find that within these groups, they start talking to each other and saying, no, it needs a capital letter, okay? Or, you know, it needs an S on this. Why does it need an S? It doesn't need an S, it, you know, and things like that, okay? And sometimes they might even, it might be a correct sentence, but they might correct it in a way that it didn't need correct. If he plays tennis on Tuesday is acceptable as he plays tennis on Tuesdays, okay? So, those won't necessarily be wrong, but if they said the first sentence is incorrect, if it was correct, it doesn't matter if they've written another correct sentence. They said it was incorrect, they lose their money. Okay. I think it's generally a good idea to prepare some sentences that you plan to use. It can be a bit difficult to come up with these on the spot. So write down five or six sentences. You might not use all of these because it does tend to take about five to ten minutes each round. Okay. But uh, uh, you know, have them there, and those are the sentences that you've noticed in people's writing, in uh, 
their homework and what you've been studying uh, recently. I find switch it up occasionally. Write, don't always give them incorrect sentences. Sometimes put an unexpected correct one in. Okay? If I were you, I would watch a fil that film okay, that will try to correct the word when it's actually acceptable. Okay? As in the example on the previous page, don't be afraid to put two errors into the sentence. Okay? Before you reveal the sentences are correct or incorrect, ask for a drum roll to build tension, depending on whether your, your other teachers in the school accept this. Okay? Um, if one team's dominating, change the minimum bet. Okay? Don't be afraid to be cruel. This is you know, another way of my teaching methods. Okay? Um, sometimes I even give them a minimum bet of 180. Okay? Move it right up because I have to risk a lot more if they're being really conservative and not, not losing any money. Okay? Then give a really hard one. Okay? Um, you can also, the minimum bet can be different. So if one group goes down to um, 20 pounds, then you can have the minimum bet as 10. If the other group is up at uh, 300, you could do, I don't know, 280. And that way they're sort of risking similar amounts. Okay? Well, so sorry, if they lose, they're basically similar. Okay? Um, if one or both teams lose all their money, you can play a bonus round. Write bonus 100. And then you can do, for example, uh, you can say, okay, odd numbers. One, three, point at students, and they have to say the next one. Again, these will be a little bit like we looked at that maths game. Students who aren't paying attention might end up uh, uh, not doing the, the, the correct one. The money goes to the other team. If they get to a certain amount, you might say odd numbers up to 21. If they get to 21, you divide it, and then you can start playing again because they've got money back in the bank. Okay? What you can do at the last round of the day, they've got to play all in, so the minimum bet is their full money, okay? And so they've got to be really, you put a real hard one there, okay? And then they might have to risk all their money, okay? I, in my opinion, in my experience, it's a great game to play and it's a really good way of doing error checking, okay, error correction, so that you can find out when these are there. And after every round, you can explain why the sentence was wrong and why the correct sentences needed to be corrected in that way. And they're just so much more likely to remember it as well and not make that mistake again because it's mm. been turned into a game. Exactly. Whereas if you're doing error correction with a kind of gap fill exercise, if you mark one of their sentences as wrong, they're not going to necessarily remember how to, how to admit, use that form again correctly. I know we're going a little over time, so we're just coming to the conclusions now. Okay. Um, remember that warm-ups can easily be adapted to introduce a particular topic of the lesson. Okay. We might look at this in the future, but Hangman, the, the game we all know how to play, you can put the word, the target word, can be the topic of the class. And therefore, once they've played that for five minutes, you've got that topic up there and you can maybe even circle it and do some brainstorming or mind map. Okay, might be a good way. Um, I'll hand over to Cathy for this. Um, games need to be two things at the same time, uh, fun for the students and easy for you to set up. This is kind of what we said um, and before. Everything that we've looked at kind of takes the pressure off the teacher. You can use these at any time because they don't take much preparation whatsoever, but they're also real fun for the students, either because they're um, trying to win something together or they're competing against each other. Mm. Um, so for games to be these two things, try to keep a few things in mind. Uh, choose things that need minimal setup time for yourself, of course. Keep them quick and don't overuse them because these are games and you want the kids to enjoy them. Mm. So if you play one of these warmers for 15, 20 minutes, the kids are going to get bored. The warmers are all designed to be, to be quick games. Yeah. Even Grammar Casino, you know, they might want to, if you play it less often than they want to, it'll be fun. It'll keep being fun. Read the classroom. Are they tired and they need waking up? So play a game that makes them stand up and run around. Or are they restless and, and need to be grounded? Therefore, play a game that really makes them focus a lot, like the, uh, like the maths game. Mm -hmm. And reward students every now and then. So once you have 
five or six games that you've played with them a few times, ask them which game they want to play. Because as we've shown, lots of these games can be adapted to any topic um, that, you're, that you're working on at the time. Yeah. And uh, we do intend on this uh, being the first in a series of webinars on games. So let us know in the chat if there's other games that uh, you've played or that you'd like to know about. Um, and uh, you can always email us too. But uh, we have a lot of new, more ideas as uh, seasoned English teachers. I'm sure um, um, Kathy and my other colleagues, Rebecca and Ruth, have a lot of ideas that uh, of games we like playing in class. So, so we're going to be uh, coming back to this, I'm sure, uh, in a few webinars time. Um, as I said, let us know ideas. Uh, if you've got ideas for future webinars, I'd be happy to hear them. Please let me know. Okay. Um, thanks for your attention and thanks for your participation, Kathy, particularly. Um, you'll receive your certificate of participation and a worksheet. Okay. Uh, we don't have any, uh, sorry, a handout. We don't have any worksheets because these games are really on the fly, no preparation games. Okay. But there's a lot of links there. Email us if you don't receive it. We are going to be having a look at uh, next week, next Thursday, at the same time, encouraging speaking at elementary level. So uh, bring it, come back for that one. It's going to be uh, something that often uh, elementary students, we neglect their speaking skills. I think this one will uh, give you some tactics to get them speaking. Okay? Thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining and playing games with us today. Okay, yeah, thanks for playing along. A lot of people with some good ones on Milkshake, they kept on coming through, didn't they? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thanks a lot, guys. Take care, have a nice evening. Okay, bye, bye, bye.